9. Um, I want to begin with uh, this statement as I began the last two lessons because it has reminded us that the gospel is good news. And that is an overarching theme throughout the gospel of Mark. That the story of Jesus is meant to be good news. Um, A church member once asked Martin Luther this question. Why do you preach the gospel to us week after week? And Luther replied, because week after week you forget it. And we never graduate from needing the grace of God. That we are a people who live our lives under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And the gospel is the most heart-transforming, life-orienting power in the universe. And the gospel is not a cute, cuddly, warm puppy. But it is a disruptive, yet liberating kingdom. And one of the things that um, I, I want to make sure that, that you understand as well, that when we talk about discipleship, discipleship is hard. Discipleship is, um, is what we are called to. But that is why when we are baptized, we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to live the kind of life that God invites us to. Because what, how, how cruel would God be if he was to say, okay, this is the kind of life I want you to live, and I want you to live this way, but never give you the power to do it. And when you're baptized, you receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, and, and sometimes people will hear us talk about discipleship and think, you know what, that's too hard, I can't do it. And you're right, if it's on your own, you can't. And that's why we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit, I don't know if, you're, if you grew up like this, but you know, sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit in the church that I grew up in, it was always in something that we should be afraid of. That you needed to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. And it confuses me because why would we ever need to be afraid of a gift from God? And by the way, whenever you're baptized, regardless of what age you are, you receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift of the Holy Spirit comes upon all of us in full form. If you're 70 years old, you get the full monty of the Holy Spirit. If you're 12 years old, you get the full Holy Spirit. You don't get the happy meal size Holy Spirit you get the full Holy Spirit that comes and lives in your life that empowers you to be able to live in the way that God has called and invited us to live and it is through the gospel this good news that we haven't just been rescued from the myth of self-righteousness and the futility of legalism This gospel is the power in our lives that claims all things and changes everything. And the gospel is this amazing, humbling, worship-producing good news. Because it says to you and me, because Jesus was strong for me, I can be weak. Because Jesus won for me, I can lose. That because Jesus was someone, I'm free to be nobody. That because Jesus was extraordinary, I can be ordinary. Because Jesus succeeded for me, I am free to fail. And by the way, wouldn't you rather fail doing something spectacular for God than being safe in disobedience? But God's plan isn't merely to get you and me into heaven one day, but to get more of heaven into earth us and more in hev- of heaven on earth every day that the gospel doesn't just free us from a bunch of empty things it also frees us from the tyranny of having to live for ourselves and it frees us to be able to live for the one who died for us our king 
King Jesus, our merciful, wonderful Savior. Because the gospel is good news. And all God's people say, Amen. So, um, tonight we're going to look at a section of Mark that is critically important. Because Mark is uh, writing this collection of Peter's recollections to a church that is undergoing terrible persecution. And the question that they're having to ask themselves every day, is Jesus worth it? And Jesus chooses a cross, and if Jesus chose a cross, then what does that mean for us personally and corporately as a community of the people of God? That if we follow a man with a cross on his back, where do we think that's going to lead us? Um, I'm a, a big history movie buff. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Civil War movie Glory. Great movie. And there's a scene from the movie. And, and the movie Glory, for those of you who haven't seen it, is the telling of the first black regiment of soldiers to fight against the Confederacy in the American Civil War. And the beauty of, of the movie was that it was more than just the tensions between North and South. It is a story that is focused on a group of courageous, patriotic black men and the tensions with the untrained and often uneducated white officers. And the movie did a great job of illustrating where the real battle was. Could these two groups come together at a very critical time and learn how to respect and honor one another. Now, there is a, 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 an antagonist in the movie, a young black man, who openly declared that he would not carry the colors of his commander. But through the movie, this young man and his commanding officer began to gain respect for one another. And you may remember this scene that when the young white officer is killed in the charge of battle, this young man picks up the colors and shouts to his fellow soldiers to follow him as they ran up the hill to die beside the body of the officers. And the closing scene of the movie is you see these two young, brave men buried together. And in a real sense, the question they dealt with was the same question that the Gospel of Mark deals with. When you follow a man who is going to die, where do you think that's going to take you? Because your answer informs something about the love and respect that you have for the man you follow. Um... Many years ago, we used to sing a song in church. We don't really sing it that much anymore. But um, where he leads, I'll follow. Remember that old song? Uh, if we had hymn books, we'd, we'd pull them out and try to, try to wrangle through that tonight. But, but that, that, that song is a, is a prayer song that would say, okay, God, you know, I, I really want to be this courageous. I really want to be that brave that wherever you lead, I'll follow. And... Um, but sometimes that song is a whole lot easier to sing than it is to live. Amen? So let me kind of tell you a funny story. Some hungry mice are behind the walls of a very well-stocked kitchen. And, and the problem is that on the other side of the wall is a really big, hungry, scary cat. But the hunger of the mice gets the best of them one day, and they decide they're going to sneak past this sleeping cat. And as they get past the cat, almost to where they wanted to get to, the cat opens one eye and glares at them. Now, one of the mice began immediately to bark like a dog. And the cat perked up his ears and ran quickly away from the mice. And the, one, and the, and the, my, and the, the mouse who was barking turned to his friend and says, See, this is a good lesson. Sometimes it pays to be bilingual. <laughs> now, 
if, if you want to be an effective disciple, not only do we need to understand how the world looks at life, but we also need to have a perspective that comes under the shadow of the cross. And that is especially true when it comes to our relationship with other people. Because the peace of the cross gives us a new way of looking at others. Now, remember what we talked about yesterday. One of the things about the context of the Gospel of Mark is that the church in Rome is experiencing terrible persecution. And Christians daily are having to decide the answer for themselves to this question, is Jesus worth dying for? And their choices are bothersome to many of them. And Mark is having to remind them and assure them that the Jesus they follow, the Jesus that they love, and the kingdom of which they have pledged allegiance to is led by a suffering servant savior. And Jesus, just like us, does, is not calling on them to make choices that he didn't have to make as well. He chose to surrender his life. And following a master like that means that sometimes there are going to be high prices that have to pay, be paid. Because discipleship, write this on your, out, on, on your notes if you're taking notes, uh, discipleship doesn't mean anything different than messiahship. And that is the, the crux of, of Mark, especially in this verse from Mark 8, 34. We've looked at this before coming up on the screen. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And we talked about this last night. This is what you have to do. Deny yourself and take up your cross. Now, tonight, I want to talk about what does the cross mean for your relationships. And I got to tell you that the, the section of text that we're going to look at tonight is um, it's a tough section of text. It, we're going to swim in the deep end of the pool for a little bit. Because Mark is going to tie together some thoughts that, that seem to, 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 be, uh, to be connected so let's go ahead um, and open up um, in your Bibles, Mark 9. And on my PowerPoint behind me, I know that um, it's, the text is going to start in verses 42 through 48, but I really want to start a little earlier. So let's go to verse 39, and then we'll pick up on the screen as it comes up the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, let's do one more. Nope. Nope, let's go back. Okay, um, let's go to Mark 9, 42, or 39 through 50. And I'm going to read this. It's not going to be up on the screen, so I hope you're following along in your Bibles. Um, start in verse 39. Do not stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name in the next moment can say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone thrown around his neck. But if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. Now, Mark is going to stream together in this text uh, a stream of thoughts that seem to be connected. 
Um, for instance, in verse 39, he's going to use the phrase, in my name. That, that if one is doing a miracle for Jesus, and he says, in my name. Now, then in verse 41, he says, if anyone gives you a cup of water in my name. Um, and then uh, in verse 41, or verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones to sin. Now, again, it is that same phrase, but do you notice it's a different setting? Now, in verse 43, verse 45, and verse 47, that phrase causes you to sin um, and is, is, is there as well. And it's not used for someone else, but it's directed to you. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, if your foot causes you to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, and then in verse 48, he uses the word fire. But then, do you notice in verse 49, he uses the word fire in a different way. He says in verse 48, um, he says, where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. And then he says, where everyone will be salted with fire. Um, and then in verse 49, he uses the word salt. But then in verse 50, he uses it in a totally different way than in verse uh, 49 and this is a hard text because what Mark has done is linked together a few sayings of Jesus that have in common certain words and it may not mean the same thing and then and when he uses it in one verse it may not mean the same thing in the next verse but the key to understanding this whole text is the end of verse 50 be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. Now, as we walk through these verses, we know that the end result that Jesus is driving toward is we need to learn to live at peace with one another. And this whole conversation begins in chapter 9, verse 34, with the disciples fussing about who's going to be the greatest. And they have not understood the implications of, of what it means if you follow a cross-carrying Christ. That if you are following a man on his way to die, should you really be having arguments with one another about who the greatest is going to be? No. You should be at peace with each other. And that is what Jesus is trying to teach us here. And that is hard sometimes. What does it do to our witness to the world whenever we as a group of disciples cannot live in peace with one another? What does it do to our witness to the world, do you think? I'm sorry? It kills it. Why? Okay. Okay. That if we are trying to, to preach love to the rest of the world, but yet we cannot get along with one another, our message sometimes doesn't ring true to the rest of the world. It's a great point, Tim. What else does a, a, does, does a body full of tension do to the body and our witness? Any other thoughts? Okay, yeah, that, that, that we look so much like them. That we are called to be different, we're called to look different, we're called to act different, we're called to be different. But when we can't get along with one another, it's almost as if we mirror their behaviors. Or maybe they're mirroring ours. What else? That's right. Mm-hmm. That's like the family dynamic even in your own home. That's a great point. That, that when there's tension in your home, and, and, you know, I shared with you last night that, you know, my wife and I have been married for over 30 years, and, you know, there are still times where things can be a little tense. Um, and if, if all of your energy is focused on that tension, then the other things that you have to be able to work on, and even the other things that you have to be able to celebrate, you don't have the energy for it. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Yes, sir, Tim. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
That's right. That if we're not unified in our message, then what, what, are, we, what are we saying to people? What are we communicating to them? And they're not hearing uh, a, a unified message, and that's leaving them to have to interpret rather than us being able to help frame how they should interpret. That's a great point. Any other comments, questions? Yes, Luke. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, one of the things, um, I, I've been slogging through a book the last uh, six months called Your Body Keeps Score. And it talks about the long-term effects of stress and tension on your body. That it is, and, and, and it is a, I, I have to read like, one page and set it down and then have to come back and read it again. I mean, it's very clinical, but, it, but, but, but the whole point of it, have you read it? Oh, okay. Uh, apparently, Jeff is going to get a copy sometime in the mail this week. The Body Keeps Score. Um, and it's by a guy, I, I think he's Danish or something, but, but it is, it is, it sets forth a really arresting premise to me that, you know, the tension that you carry and the stress that you carry in your body has to go somewhere. And if it's not going somewhere, it is eroding your body. And, and by the way, what do you think our bodies, as Luke mentioned, what do you think happens to the church body with all that tension? And by the way, when you have that tension in the church body, We've experienced this at the church that I preach at in Charlotte. Um, we had something that happened over 40 years ago at Providence Road that um, our church is still trying to get over. And to the kids who were children, you know, 40 years ago when this happened, the few that are still at our church, they still remember that and, and, and carries wounds for them. So it, it, is, it, is a, it is a generational issue. So let me give you some, um, some things to think about, about how do we live at peace with one another. Because I think when we talk about discipleship and Jesus is calling his disciples and he's helping train them and he's helping teach them, he's going to talk to them about relationships. And by the way, relationships is often an area in discipleship that we really don't talk a lot about. But it has a lot to do with discipleship. And, and here's the first thing. Um, so being a cross-reference community means, uh, number one, some things have to halt. Some things have to halt. Um, earlier in Mark chapter 9, there was a man that the disciples stopped because he was casting out demons. And he wasn't doing it because he was fake. Or wasn't really doing it. He was. And he was doing it in the name of Jesus. And they stopped him for two reasons. One, because they didn't know him. And secondly, because he wasn't one of them. Jesus said, you don't do that. God is working through many people in my name whom you don't know. And maybe in that story, one of the things that Jesus wants us to wrestle with is this. One thing his disciples don't do is say, you've got to stop working in the name of Jesus because we don't know them. And we have to decide what that means for us. That's an interesting text. Um, and, 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 and secondly... Um, you need to assess your fault. Now, in, in Mark 9, 42 through 48, some of the passages that we read, uh, Jesus is taking the focus off of others. And do you notice how he's trying to get them to stop focusing on others and really focus on themselves? He is saying you should not think that discipleship is about going along trying to stop other people. Maybe you need to be thinking about and looking at the things in your own life that is causing other people to stumble.
Because the disciples have some stinking thinking going on. And by the way, one of the implications of being a disciple of Jesus is you seriously take the impact of your influence on other people. Um, Our culture that we live in makes it very hard to live as disciples because the prevailing message of our culture is this. You're the most important thing. You're the sun in your own solar system that everything else needs to rotate around. Not others. As a matter of fact, uh, look, uh, um, you have an influence. Understand, you have an influence on those around you. You have an influence on those around you. So never underestimate the damage that little things can do. Um, Several years ago, the space shuttle Columbia was delayed as NASA searched for problems that were indicated by the onboard computer and by sensors that were on the shuttle. And they found that the problem was a clogged hydraulic system. The fix was five quarts of oil that cost $25, but it cost $3 million a day to look for the fix. Now that'll preach, because little things can create great and tragic consequences. And Jesus is telling the disciples, have the courage to look at your own life and be willing to have the courage to get radical if you have to get anything out of your life that causes these little ones to stumble. And then here's the second thing on this point. Um, Consequences can last forever. Consequences can last forever. You know, I I don't know about you, but um, in Charlotte, talking about hell has really gone out of favor in a lot of churches. And by the way, when we talk about it, people kind of squirm a little bit, get a little uncomfortable. But nobody in all of Scripture talked about hell more than Jesus did. And hell's not a popular doctrine. But it is real, and Jesus believed it. And by the way, why do we need a Savior if there's nothing to be saved from? Why, Why do we need a Savior? And Jesus talked about hell and the tragic consequences for people who care so much for themselves that they are heartless in their actions and it causes them to lead others to sin against God. And by the way, it's really interesting in some of your, uh, in some of your translations, there's the word Gehenna that, that's used there. And that was the name of a valley outside Jerusalem where the evil kings of Israel, all the way back in the Old Testament, influenced by pagan practices, actually sacrificed children to a god named Molech. And if you remember your Old Testament, you remember the story of King Josiah. And King Josiah leads a reform, leads a revival, and determined that that valley that had shed, where they had shed the blood of their own children was too detestable for any other use, and he turned it into Jerusalem's garbage dump. That's where they would take the, the refuse and, uh, and, and the trash of Jerusalem. It was a place where garbage was taken. It was a place where carcasses of dead animals and even sometimes people would be taken to be dumped. And fires were always burning there and so, so, that, the, so that the refuse and, and garbage would kind of burn away. But sometimes the fires would get out of control and it was a place where all kind of insects and nastiness thrived like maggots and worms and nobody ever wanted to go to Gehenna. And in the intertestamental literature, the Apocrypha, the Jews said, Gehenna is kind of like hell. And, and, And Jesus said it was real. And because it's real, Jesus was ruthless about the call for us to deal with the issue of sin in our lives. And Jesus' point here in, in Mark is, dealing with sin should not requ- does not require a five-year plan. You deal with it immediately. And you deal with it now. 
think it's one of the Puritan writers, may have been John Owen, who once wrote um, that you need to be killing sin or that sin is going to kill you. And Jesus says it may even require some radical surgery. You cut off your hand if it causes you to sin. You cut off your foot if it causes you to sin. You cut out your eye if it causes you to sin. And it is better to miss those things than to miss heaven by disobeying God. That it is better to go limping into heaven than going running into hell. Um, one of my favorite writers of the early 20th century, uh, this guy, short story writer, um, William Sidney Porter, a guy named O. Henry was his pen name. He tells one story uh, about a young family where a mom dies tragically at an early age. And the little girl and her father live in an apartment together in New York City, or in a big city. I think it's New York. But every day, the dad would come home from work, and she would say, Daddy, would you play with me, please? And he would sit down and grab his newspaper, get a cigar, and he would say, I'm too busy. Go outside and play in the street. Well, she did. And the story progresses to a point where she grows up on the street. And then she begins to do things on the street. And the little girl dies like her mom, tragically because of a hard lifestyle. And then O'Henry writes how that he imagines that she goes to the gates of heaven and Peter meets her. And he says to Jesus, Lord, we have another one at the gate. Should I throw her into hell? And in O. Henry's uh, imagination, Jesus says, no, no, you let her in, but you find that man who wouldn't play with that little girl and you send him to hell. Now, I think O. Henry must have read Mark 9. Because it is serious business to not care about your life and its influence on others. And these are hard words. But Jesus didn't cut off an arm. He didn't give up a foot. He didn't give up an eye. He laid down his life so that the little ones could be saved. And I know that's hard talk, and I don't like talking about it, and I know sometimes many people don't like hearing it. But we've got to share the full story. People can't appreciate how much the good news is until we know the bad news. It is by only framing the bad news that we can help people appreciate how good the good news really is. Comments, questions. Tell me what you're thinking. Have some banter with me. I'm sorry, say it one more time, Walter. It's a great question. Have you ever known anybody to do it? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the point, one of the points that Jesus is making here, you need to be that possibly that radical. If you, if, if you know that there is sin in your life that you're going to have to deal with, you need to be that radical or be willing to be that radical with it. Just like, you know, I, you know, I don't know that Jesus meant, um, you know, okay, you know, hate your father and mother. I don't think he means it in the way that we take the word hate. But I also want to be careful that we don't water down the words of Jesus because he did say this. Because sometimes I'm enough of a people pleaser where I want to water down the words of Jesus. But this is what he says. And we can't get around it. And we've got to say what Jesus said. That's a great question, Walter. Thank you. Great comment. Any other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
And tomorrow night, um, you've really given me a great segue to the lesson tomorrow night. Because tomorrow night, we're going to talk about that concept of accountability. Because we'll be in Mark chapter 6, where Jesus sends the disciples out two by two. And why does he send them out two by two? I think part of it is the accountability piece that's there. That's a great point. Great point. Any others? Now, I'm sorry, go ahead, Corey. Any other any other adjectives you have for him, man? Uh, okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that, Corey, because I, you know, I'm... I'm a lot like that too. I'm I'm seeking that middle ground. How do I, I seek that? And I appreciate you sharing that struggle. Lou? Well, let's talk about salt for a minute. And maybe we'll answer that question. So let's look. Um and here's here's the next thing. Um go ahead and turn it back. Uh, uh, yeah, well, let's go ahead here. Uh, for everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with one another. Um, now, there are some really hard statements there to understand because Mark kind of mixes his metaphors and like I said earlier, salt doesn't mean the same thing in verse 49 as it does in verse 50. Now, in verse 49, we have a religious setting in view. If you go back to the Old Law, or if you go back to the Old Testament, uh, the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus stipulated that whenever you took a sacrifice to the temple, in order to make it acceptable to God, you should sprinkle it with salt as a symbol of holiness and purity. And what Jesus is saying here is that everybody is going to, that is going to be a sacrifice to God, to God uh, is uh, sprinkled with fire. And, and that's a really good metaphor for discipleship because we are called to be living sacrifices. We are called to present ourselves before God holy and blameless. And the one way that God makes us an acceptable offering is that he sprinkles us with, with that fire. And what is that fire? Look, look at this text from Peter as it comes up on the screen. Uh, so be truly glad. There is joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with glorious and expressible joy. And by the way, here, here's the, the third thing that I would challenge us with. Um, Pass the salt. Pass the salt. Because a lot of us would say, don't pass that stuff my way. I don't, I don't want that kind of salt, Jesus. I don't, I don't want that. 
I want Jesus, but I don't want all these hard choices that I've got to make about saying no to this or saying no to that. But the reality of it, friends, is you can't have it that way. If you are going to follow Jesus, all of our lives are going to be sprinkled with fire. We're going to be tested. We are going to be tried. We will face difficult choices. And maybe what Jesus is saying here is our choice is either to accept the fire of discipleship or face the fire of hell. And this was a really special word for the original hearers of Mark's message because that is exactly the situation they find themselves in. Because in verse 50, notice that the setting changes from a religious scenario to a domestic setting. And, and by the way, this isn't unusual happening. This is not an unusual happening to switch metaphors. Um, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is simultaneously the temple. He's the veil. He's the sacrifice. He's the priest. All in the same book. This time in verse 50, you're the salt. In verse 49, you're the sacrifice that gets salted. In verse 50, you are the salt. You are called to be this pervasive influence of good in the world. By the way, what, what is it that sets a disciple apart? How, how do you decide if a disciple is great? Is it, is it when they have money? Is it when they have worth? Is it when they have influence? Is it the number of years in the church? Is it the amount of money that you give each year to be able to support God's work? No. What sets us apart as disciples and what measures our, I don't really want to use the word greatness, but what can measure our effectiveness is our saltiness. But Jesus wants you to be salty. Salty not in the way of the world. And if you're not salty, how useful are you? And what is this saltiness that we can leave? It is that spirit of devotion and self-sacrifice for Jesus and the gospel for people to be able to see. Remember this text from Mark chapter 8, verse 35. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. That if we lose that sacrificing spirit, if we lose that kind of thinking that says, I'm a cross carrier and sacrifice is my lifestyle. If we lose that, then we lose our usefulness. Um, read a story in National Geographic. I think it was in... Um, I think it was somewhere in 1999. But they were having a celebration of a hero in Japan because over 100 years ago, he woke up on a cliff that overlooked the village underneath. And this man was the richest man in town because his rice paddies in his village produced more than anybody else's. Now, the night before, there had been an earthquake. And that wasn't unusual for the area of Japan where this man and his neighbors lived. And the people went about their business, and he and the man is, is, is up above on the cliff, and he looks down at the village below, and he can see the ocean beyond, and the ocean is churning, and it's darker than it usually is. And the water is flowing against the wind, and he immediately knew this means trouble. And he calls his grandson quickly to bring him a torch, and he ran as hard as he could. And he began to set the rice paddies on fire that was ready to be harvested and to be sold for a small fortune. And the villagers think the old man has totally lost his mind. And as a village, because this was the way that they did things, they all raced uphill to be able to help the man save his crops. And as they reached the top of the hill to try to extinguish the fires, the old man told them to stop and to turn around and face the ocean and when they did, they could see this dark line of water coming in from the ocean toward the shore. And the earthquake had created this tsunami that was racing to the shore. And it was coming not once, but five times to pound that little village. And it left their homes crushed and ruined. But among them stood an old man 
who was now the poorest man in that whole village, or among the poorest, but he had saved 400 lives. How do you live at peace with each other? You do it not by arguing over who's the greatest, but by sacrificing everything you have for your brother and sister. And it all comes back to the cross. And what kind of discipleship will we follow? A guy named Bill Hull, a friend of mine, uh, has written a book. In one of his books, he says, The gospel we preach determines the disciples we make. And I agree with what Bill wrote in his book. Because think about what sometimes churches in America, some churches in America will preach. We want to preach a prosperity gospel. So then what, what kind of disciple does prosperity gospel generate? Somebody who when things go wrong and things don't go their way and somehow or another they have some kind of financial hardship that their faith kind of crumbles and they don't know quite what to do with it. What about the gospel of performance? That we want to you know, preach a gospel of performance and what kind of disciples do we end up producing in that? People who are tired and worn out and grouchy and cranky. Because if it's to be and it's up to me, i got to work. I can't afford taking time off. And think about what, um, what this means for us as disciples. Because the gospel that we preach determines the kind of disciples we make. Um, because it all comes back to the cross. Comments, questions before I wrap up. I've got a couple things I want to give you before we wrap up. Any comments, questions? Tell me what you're thinking. Well, you're either all asleep or mad. I don't know which it is. But either way, it's all right. It's all right. Yes, Tim. Determines the disciples we make. Hmm? I'm glad you asked me to repeat that and not the one about uh, y'all are either asleep or mad. So That's the one I, I was getting ready to quote. <laughs> so let me give you two thoughts coming up on the screen. Here's the first one. Uh, discipleship implications. First of all, understand judging the sacrifice is, is Jesus' task, not yours. All these questions about who in Mark, in Mark 9, who's the greatest? The question about who's in, who's out, um, they do not belong to a list of people who belong on an altar. Jesus said, if you've got to judge somebody, judge yourself. I was in a, a conference one time, and um, I heard a, a, a friend of mine named Randy Harris say this. It's always stuck with me. He was preaching, and, and uh, there was a couple hundred of us in a, a, a room, and um, he was talking about um, discipleship. And he stopped, and he said, okay, here's a test I want you to do. He said, I want you to stop and pray right now for the most sinful person you know. He gave us five minutes. And the whole room went quiet. And we're praying. And I immediately think of somebody. So then, five minutes later, Randy says, Okay, here's a question I want to ask you. Was yours the first name that came to mind? And now about 200 people, there may have been three people who raised their hand. You see, judging sacrifice is his task. Dying to myself is my task. And, and write this on your outline, or write this on your notes if you're taking notes. I'm used to teaching with outlines. Discipleship never means something to messiahship. We have said that at every session. Because the worst thing that could happen to us is getting the Jesus we want 
rather than the Jesus we need. The Jesus who gives us a thumbs up to every decision. I think, go ahead and put that up on the screen. A Jesus who gives us a thumbs up to every decision. A Jesus who affirms in our minds no matter how stupid we become. A kind of a weak, spined, and boot-licking Savior. That's not Jesus. The Jesus we need is Jesus of truth, and mercy, and grace, and love, and discipline. We need the real Jesus, and if the real Jesus goes to Jerusalem, then that means I have to go too. That we are called to be living sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Marshall Keeble was a black preacher in, our, in the Church of Christ Fellowship for many years. And Marshall Keeble, when he would preach on Romans 12, 1, he'd talk about us being living sacrifices. He's, he would say, you know, the Lord calls us to be living sacrifices, but the problem is we keep crawling off the altar. And I kind of like that. But we need to keep getting on. Discipleship is equivalent to $1,000. Imagine $1,000. And, um, and you have that $1,000 and you can spend it in any way that you want for Jesus. A martyr comes along in a blaze of glory and could spend $1,000 in one fell swoop and die for Jesus. But the reality is in St. Robert, Missouri, most of us don't face that choice. Rather, God invites us to spend a quarter every day until it's all gone. 25 cent for an older sister who has no friends but you. A quarter for a brother who betrayed you and lied about you quarter for a sister that you may need to forgive when it comes to forgiveness sometimes that's more of a dollar ten dollars fifty dollars sometimes even five hundred dollars you see there are a lot of ways to measure discipleship but one of the ways that we measure discipleship is by relationship and the question of the text is this, are we living at peace with one another? Because the world will never know we are his disciples until we learn to love one another. Comments, questions, any, anything else you wanna, would like to share? Yep, yep, Marshall Keeble. Yep, we keep crawling off the altar. Uh, by the way, you can still listen to some of his sermons. Uh, Lipscomb University has just uh, released uh, some audio recordings of Marshall Keeble preaching. And if you ever get a chance to listen to it, you can go to Lipscomb's, Lipscomb's website or type in Marshall Keeble, Lipscomb University, and uh, be able to listen to some of those old recordings. They're really something really something. It's a powerful preacher. Any other comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. Messiahship. Yes. I love that you guys take notes. This, Jeff, you, you have done some wonderful work and training with your church. I love this. I love this. This just does my heart good. What else? I saw another hand come up. I see another hand. Oh, okay, okay. Any others? Well, I know this has been a hard lesson. Thank you for your grace to me. And thank you for your grace that you've extended to me over the last three sessions. Tomorrow night, we will be in Mark 6. Um, I got confused, as I said earlier tonight. I planned on doing Mark 6 tonight. 
um, and um, but uh, but we'll do March six tomorrow night. So thank you for bearing with me and all of my confusion tonight because I had not even looked at these notes for tonight's class. So uh, that just and you could you could probably tell now that it helps me even to look at the notes very much. Can I pray with you and we'll be dismissed? Father, give us peace. Father, send your spirit of peace upon us. That as we live in peace with one another and we practice discipleship with one another, Father, may it help us in our sharing the good news of Jesus so that as we love one another well, people see you. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for the uh, city that's set upon a hill that, uh, that this church is to this community. And bless them. And bless those who come out tonight to hear a good word from your word. And Father, thank you that even for us, the gospel is good news. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people say, amen. Thank you, friends. You're dismissed. Okay. You might not have some questions. Well, here's my question. I just don't really know the answer to that. Okay. They had a problem with the class. Mm-hmm.